Good morning, ladies. I did a lot of jobs just then. <laughs> okay. Um, hello. My name is Dina Clark, and if you're new, we're so glad. I did meet two new ladies this morning, Donna and Marilyn, wherever you are. We're glad you're here. Hello, hello. Um, and so, you know, I'm Dina. I'm one of the co-teachers of um, Women in the Word. And uh, last week, we're in the Book of Acts, and our series is called Receive Power. Um, and last week, we were in Acts 5. And Van taught us um, from there uh, where we saw the persecution of the new church continues. And the apostles were brought before the Sanhedrin. And you'll remember that that's that powerful governing body of the religious and spiritual issues of the Jewish people. And again, the apostles chose to fear and obey God rather than men. As representatives of the all-powerful God, they had nothing to truly fear from the judgment of, of men, and it showed they had, were able to stand tall. Today we are covering two chapters. We are in Acts uh, 6 and 7, and because it's so much, we're not going to be able to read every single verse, but we are going to meet someone else who stood tall in the face of persecution. The title of our lesson is Power to Stand. Now, Satan's attacks on the new baby Christian church have come from many angles. He has used intimidation and threats. In chapter 5, he attacked the church from within with deception. And these strategies have all been unsuccessful. The gospel is spreading. The church is growing. So now Satan attempts to divide and conquer. A strategy of pitting one group of Christians against the other in conflict. And the beautiful unity that we've seen of this new Christian church is in jeopardy. Um, in Acts 6, as it begins, we're going to see a potential for, the, for division. And how everyone handles this conflict makes all the difference. Will you pray with me before we begin? Um, Jesus, I just thank you for your word, for the truth of it. And I thank you that it's alive and it's active and it's able. So I pray right now that your spirit rises up in every single one of us and that we're able to grab hold of what you have for us, that you will illuminate the scriptures, you will illuminate the truth of who you are, and that we will walk out of here knowing more about you, how much you love us, and what you empower us to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so starting in Acts 6, verse 1. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So there are two groups in the Christian church here. All of them follow Jesus, but we have, um, they come from different backgrounds. So we have the Hebraic Jews, which your translation may, translation may just read Hebrews. Um, they spoke Aramaic, which was a classical, um, a form of classical Hebrew that people of Jewish descent often spoke. They were mostly from Judea and they were inclined to embrace Jewish culture. Then you have the Hellenistic Jews who spoke Greek, which was the language of the day, and they were from all over the Roman Empire. And they were more inclined to embrace Greek culture. So an oversimplification of their history would be this. Uh, Hebraic Jews thought Hellenistic Jews were unspiritual compromisers with Greek culture and considered them second-class Israelites. And the Hellenistic Jews regarded Hebraic Jews as holier than thou traditionalists. Traditionalist. So both groups were part of the Christian church, but they had a natural suspicion toward each other, and Satan tried to use that to his advantage. In verse 1 in the King James Version, it reads, There arose a murmuring. Kent Hughes says, When the murmuring begins, the devil smiles. So... This held great potential for really the first church split. And what we're going to see is godly leadership at work and a congregation that is willing to be part of the solution. Now, the law stated that one of the responsibilities of uh, the Jewish people was to care for the widows and the orphans in their community. Uh, there was provision for this with the temple funds. So the new Christian church is following this pattern, but the Hellenistic Jews felt like the food and supplies were not being distributed evenly and their um, widows were not really getting, they were being neglected. So there's no indication in scripture that this was deliberate. You know, the church is growing, they need to adjust and kind of learn how to manage all these things. The, the ones with the complaint took it to the leadership and in verse two, the apostles call basically a congregational meeting, making the people the part of the solution. In chapter six, verses two through the beginning of verse five, <laughs> 
So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. Now, in verse 2, when it says wait on tables, that sounds kind of harsh, like maybe the apostles are like, this job is beneath me or beneath us. But it actually um, isn't about serving food and busing tables. The word table at the time and a place where a money changer did his collecting and exchanging of money. So this is about the administration of the distribution of money and provisions and care for the widows. And it's actually a question of calling. Verse 4 in the message reads that the apostles said, Meanwhile, we'll stick to our assigned task of prayer and speaking God's word. So the apostles recognize that everyone has a different gift or has different gifts. And they have different assignments or tasks from God to be used in different spheres. Point number one, we all are called to serve with different gifts in different spheres. All are called... to serve with different gifts in different spheres. All are called to serve with different gifts in different spheres. The apostles knew their assigned tasks and that they couldn't focus on using the gifts they'd been given if they tried to do everybody else's jobs. They had been assigned the ministry of the word, as it says in verse 4. And they realized that they had to delegate to others. They had to identify those with the gifts needed to meet the widow's needs. This is a sign of really good leadership. I love this quote by David Guzik uh, on this scripture. He said, they didn't throw the complainers out. They didn't divide into two congregations. They didn't shun the unhappy people. They didn't form a committee and discuss the problem to death. <laughs> Death by committee. Okay, so the solution was choose seven men from the congregation to oversee this, but with these character qualifications. Verse 3 says, known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. James Montgomery Boyce says the problem was essentially spiritual. Therefore, it needed persons who were spirit-filled to deal with them. Verse number 3 in the message says, men full of Holy Spirit and good sense. Y'all laugh because it said men, didn't you? That's <laughs> mean. These men needed to be spiritually and practically minded. The Greek word here for distribution of food in verse 1 is the same word that the apostles use for their job when they say in verse 4, ministry of the word. And it is a form of the word that you see in verse 2 that is weight, as in weight on tables. The word is diakonia. D-I-A-K-O-N-I-A, -I -I and it means, whether you're using it as a verb or a noun, it means service or to serve. So to think of the apostles as spiritual servants and these men as practical or administrational service is wrong because point number two, to serve practically is to serve spiritually. To serve practically is to serve spiritually. To serve practically is to serve spiritually. I often hear women say something along the lines of, you know, I don't, I really don't think I have a gift. False. The Bible says everyone has at least one God-given gift. And then I'll hear women say, well, I have a gift, but my gift's not really very important. It's kind of boring. I'm, I'm good at organizing and administration. Also false. Because I'll tell you something. If Beth and I did not have people with those gifts on this team, this entire thing would fall apart <laughs> completely. I'm going to use someone as an example. She's not going to like this, but I want you to know that you have a greeting chair named Lynn. And she is here before me every day. Single, I cannot beat her to this building. I can't. I've tried, actually, I've tried. I'm like, I'm going to see if I can get there before Lynn. Ben, no, Lynn's already done things. 
Lynn puts up our room signs. She places the clipboards with the questions into each room. She puts out the booklets, the name tags, the registration sheets. She helps new people that are signing in and have come and joined us. She schedules those smiling faces that greet you every single morning. Lynn serves us spiritually as she serves us practically. And I'm grateful. The word diakonia is where we get the word deacon. Now, nowhere in this chapter in Acts are these men called deacons, but they are considered the, the first church deacons that are later described in scripture, like in 1 Timothy 3. Deacon simply means servant. And these men were certainly servants who served practically, and therefore they served spiritually. Now, verse 5 says that everyone thought this was a great idea, and then it lists the chosen men's name. Here's something interesting. Every name on that list is a Greek name indicating that even though the Hebraic Jews made up the majority of the congregation, these men were probably all Hellenist. That's important because the church gave the control to them to take care of their widows. These men expressed a complaint, were willing to be part of the answer. And in verse 6, the apostles prayed over them and released them to do their work. Satan had tried to attack and divide the church from within. And what could have left to infighting, what could have left a division led to peace and multiplication. Verse 7 says, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests, y'all, Jewish priests, were, became obedient to the faith. Now, there are two men in that list in verse 5 that you should remember. One is Philip, who we're going to hear about when we study Acts 8, and Stephen, whose story will be the remainder of our lesson. Verse 8 tells us that Stephen performed great wonders and signs among the people. How was this, he, an ordinary man, doing extraordinary things? Well, verse 5 tells us and describes him as a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. And verse 8 describes him as a man full of God's grace and power. So he, the emphasis here with Stephen is on fullness. Stephen is full of faith. He's full of the Holy Spirit. He's full of God's grace. He's full of God's power. And remember, in Scripture means to be full of, means to be controlled by, to be surrendered to. Now, some Jewish leaders try to debate Stephen, but verse 10 tells us that that doesn't go very well. It says they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. In verses 11 through 14, it tells us that they um, then decide to trump up some false charges against Stephen. They gather false witnesses, and they stir up the people, including the elders and the teachers of the law. They have Stephen arrested and brought before the Sanhedrin. The false charges that they um, trump up are found in verses 13 and 14. It says, this fellow never stops speaking about the holy, against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that G this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. So the holy place would have been, first of all, the promised land and the Jerusalem temple where they were. Both the Jewish people, both of these things, the land, the promised land and the temple, the Jewish people were very, very proud of. They also held the law, obviously, in very high, that, that, that was handed down through Moses in very high regard and all those extra requirements that men had added to the law and um, put on the people. The customs of Moses would have been things like rituals and celebrations, feasts, sacrifices, and those kind of things. But nothing was more sacred to the Jews than the temple and the law of Moses. And to speak against them was to blaspheme. Verse 15, the last verse in chapter 6 says, All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. I was accused of cheating in college by a professor. I had not cheated, but as I defended myself, my face did not look like that of an angel. <laughs> I was mad. And here's what I've discovered in my 55 years of living about myself. When I hit seven at any, out of 10, out of any emotion, I don't care if I'm angry, I don't care if I'm sad, I don't care if I'm happy, I cry. I cry at seven. Every time. It does not make you look not guilty, by the way, in front of said professor. But what we see here is Stephen has been accused of much worse. And he begins this ordeal with a face that is reflecting the peace and confidence of one that trusts his God. All these things that the Jewish leadership is protecting, 
the promised land, the temple, the law, the customs of Moses, they're all good things. They were gifts from God given to his people, but they have turned them into idols. Chapter 7 begins with a high priest asking Stephen in verse 1, are these charges true? Stephen responds to the accusations with the longest address that you will find in the book of Acts, which is a retelling of the history of Israel from the Old Testament. It is the first ever Cliff Notes, basically. <laughs> and it's a speech, know this, that is in no way meant to win him an acquittal before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin believed God was confined to a nation, to its laws, to its customs, to a building. But in a, and in a sense, Stephen's message is point number three, get God out of that box you think he's in. Get God out of that box. You think he's in. Here's the thing, God's not even in the box. It's the Sanhedrin that's in the box and it's causing them to miss the greatness of their God and the promised Messiah, Jesus Christ. Stephen's speech highlights each of these boxes that his listeners thank God is and using the patriarchs of the Jewish faith. He's gonna talk about Abraham, Joseph, Moses, and David and Solomon. But when he talks about David and Solomon, it's really about the tabernacle and the temple. Um, that they hold so dear. So Stephen begins with the father of their faith, Abraham, in Acts 7, verses 2 through 8. Verses 2 through 3 reads this way. To this, Stephen replied, brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. The Jews believed God gave special spiritual privileges to those living within the real estate of the promised land. Here, in his speech, and then later even, Stevens is going to put an emphasis on that God is not in the box of a geographical place. God revealed his glory to, said a blessing over, spoke to Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia, which is not the promised land, it's Gentile territory, and it's before he even set one foot in the promised land. Point number four, God is not bound by geography. God is not bound by geography. <clears throat> God is not bound by geography. In chapter seven, verses four, in the beginning of verse five, it says, so he, Abraham, left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran after the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you are now living. He gave him no inheritance here, not even enough ground to set his foot on. So Abraham was a pilgrim even in the promised land. The only land that Abraham ever actually possessed in the promised land was his burial plot. This is a rebuke to the settled leaders of the people. They were in the land that God had given them. And it was a blessing but they were too much at home. John Stott says, a single thread runs right through the first part of Stephen's address. It's that the God of Israel is a pilgrim God who is not restricted to any one place. In the next verses, Stephen reminds the Sanhedrin that Abraham was saved by grace through faith and not because he was circumcised. The custom of circumcision was to be given to Abraham, but later. This is another box that the Jewish leadership thinks that God is in, these customs of, uh, that they call the customs of Moses. So point number five is God isn't bound by customs or traditions. God isn't bound by customs or traditions. Later in Acts 15, circumcision will actually be referred to as a custom of Moses, even though it's actually given to Abraham first. 
And that's because God elaborated on it and he commanded an offering that needed to be made afterwards that required a priesthood and a temple or a tabernacle, which did not even exist in the time of Abraham. So in, in fact, in Acts 15, there's going to be an entire debate where the Christian men need to be circumcised. Stephen points out in verse 8 that it was after the promise and after the blessing to Abraham that the, the custom of circumcision was even given. In verses 9 through 16, Stephen's going to speak of Joseph. Verse 9, beginning of verse 10. Because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles. Stephen emphasized that the presence of God, presence of God was with Joseph all the time. He didn't need to be in the promised land to be close to God. In fact, he was far off in Egypt. Stephen goes on and points out that God blessed and rescued the 12 sons of Jacob, all of those patriarchs that they hold so dear, in Egypt. In verse 16, it states that only their bodies return to the promised land. So Stephen continues to crack open their boxes and knock down their idols. In verses 17 through 43, he speaks of Moses, and he answers the charges that he has blasphemed against Moses and the law. This section is actually the longest part of his address, and that's because Moses was one that the um, Sanhedrin was very much mainly concerned about. God gave the law through Moses, and the leaders of the Jewish faith had built their entire li lives around keeping the letter of the law, but not the spirit of it which is what Jesus constantly pointed out to them. For example, in Matthew 23, 23, in the New Living Translation, Jesus says, What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites? For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. In verses 17 through 29 of Acts 7, Stephen reminds them that years after Joseph's death, a new pharaoh enslaves and mistreats the nation of Israel, and Moses, who's their hero, was rejected by his own people, had to flee to Midian, and he lived there for 40 years. In verses 30 through 33, after 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai. When he saw this, he was amazed at the sight. He went over to get a closer look and he heard the Lord say, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses trembled with fear and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. God appeared to Moses in the desert near Mount Sinai. That's Gentile territory again, not the promised land. God met and took care of Moses and his people outside that holy promised land. In verse 33, God says to Moses, the place where you are standing is holy ground. What made it holy was not the geography but that God was there. Wherever God is, is holy ground. And Stephen is drilling home his point. The greatest miracles of Israel actually happened in Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the desert, not the promised land, not in Jerusalem. The God of everywhere can meet his people anywhere. He is not bound by location. In verses 37 through 38, Moses promised that there was a pro prophet coming after him. And he warned Israel to listen to him. But just like their ancestors had rejected Moses, the Jewish leaders rejected Jesus, who is the prophet that Moses was talking about. Verses 37 through 41. This is the Moses who told the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your own people. He was in the assembly at the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai. And with our ancestors, and he received living words to pass on to us. But our ancestors refused to obey him. Instead, they rejected him, and in their hearts, turned back to Egypt. They told Aaron, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who led us out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. That was the time when they made the idol in the form of a calf. They brought sacrifices to it and reveled in what their own hands had made. The Israelites rejected Moses 
even after the exodus of the slave from slavery in Egypt. They made idols for themselves like the idols in Egypt. Stephen reminds them that the law that these, the Sanhedrin and these Jewish leaders are so revered and so protect, their ancestors were breaking it while Moses was receiving it. And that that rebellious attitude that Joseph's brothers had when they rejected Joseph and sold him into slavery, that the Israelites who came out of Egypt, and verse 39 says, in their hearts turned back to Egypt. That has been a characteristic of the Jewish people for their whole history. In verse 52, Stephen's going to actually ask, was there ever a prophet your, your ancestors did not persecute? I know, really. And they are following in their ancestors' footsteps steps by persecuting and rejecting Jesus. In verses 44 through 50, Stephen speaks about David and Solomon and the wilderness temple, which was portable, and then the more permanent temple in Jerusalem, which was the glory of Jerusalem at the time. It was made of a lot of gold. It literally shone like in the sun on the hill. The temple was another foundation of false security for the Jewish leaders, a box that they thought God was squarely in. In verse 48, Stephen drops this truth bomb. However, the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. Stephen is saying, take God out of that box of the temple. He's not confined to it here any more than he is to the promised land. Now, the physical temple of Jerusalem was actually destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. But, so that physical temple no longer even exists. However, scripture tells us that there is a temple today. Paul will later write in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17. This is the New Living Translation. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Point number six, God isn't bound by a building. Christ's followers are his temple. God isn't bound by a building. Christ followers are his temple. God isn't bound by a building. Christ followers are his temple. My son Walker is now 25, but when he was five years old, I distinctly remember we were taking a family walk in the neighborhood, and I was pulling him in a wagon. This was essential if you wanted the walk to last less than 16 hours. Because Walker had to touch everything and wandered off and splashed through puddles. So I had him in a a wagon. I'm pulling along in our neighborhood and we're having a wonderful time. And all of a sudden, five-year-old Walker just gasped with this epiphany. And he goes, Mommy, if Jesus lives in my heart, he's getting a little wagon ride too. (laughs) Y'all, he was right. We are the temple, and that means God goes where we go. We bring the temple, the very presence of God, into the grocery store, the hospital room, the neighbor's house, the beach, a movie theater. It doesn't matter. Stephen was accused of blasphemy against the temple, but Stephen isn't speaking against the temple. What he's doing is cautioning Israel not to worship the temple, but to worship the God of the temple. As their ancestors had worshipped the golden calf in the wilderness, they... As verse 41 says, reveled in what their own hands had made. Stephen confronted their idolatry of the temple, the box that they thought God was in. Now remember the Sanhedrin's accusations against Stephen included in, verse, in chapter 6, verse 14. We have heard him say, this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place. And Jesus had indeed taught that he would replace the temple. John 2, verses 19 through 20, Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. And they replied, It's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. And And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Jesus is referring, yes, to his resurrected body that would be raised on the third day and was raised on the third day and his spiritual body, the church, that would take the place of the physical temple. He is not bound by a building. He lives in us. 
And Jesus also under, uh, changed the understanding of the law of Moses that the Sanhedrin had accused Stephen of speaking against. In Matthew 5, 17 through 18, again, the New Living Translation, Jesus said, don't misunderstand why I've come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. Point number seven, the temple and the law find their God-intended purpose in Jesus. The temple and the law find their God-intended purpose. In Jesus. Jesus lived a life of perfect obedience to the law. He obeyed the law we couldn't obey. He died the death that we deserve. And then he rose again. Romans 8, 3 through 4 says, For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. Who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Romans 8, 4 that I just read to you in the message says it this way. What the law code, that would be the law of Moses, what the law code asked for, but we couldn't deliver is accomplished as we, instead of redoubling our own efforts, simply embrace what the Spirit is doing in us. We now have the Holy Spirit within us, and with it an energy to tap into for a Spirit-empowered obedience. Jesus did not abolish the law. He fulfilled it for us and in us. Stephen's point is that Jesus is greater than all these things that they hold so dear. And by trying to protect them, they're missing the very thing that they were meant to point to. The thrust of Stephen's message is that Jesus supersedes all of these very good things. The law, the temple, the customs, the sacrifices and uh, feasts and celebrations, they all pointed to Jesus and are fulfilled in Jesus. And that doesn't diminish their importance. That actually magnifies it. The Jews had confused physical um, descent and national heritage in a physical place with personal faith. They had pride in the rituals and the customs rather than who they had pointed to. Stephen's basic argument is that the Jews' hope of redemption was not in Moses' law or the customs or the temple or the land, but Jesus himself and that they're missing it. In verse 51 through 53, Stephen ends his speech by laying out some flat-out accusations against the Sanhedrin in case they have missed any of his subtext, applying his message to his listeners and driving home his point, you need the Savior. In verse 51, Stephen calls them stiff-necked. Now, that would be a phrase that they would recognize because it was used to describe their ancestors in the Old Testament many times. And Stephen tells them that their hearts and their ears are still uncircumcised. These are phrases that may have called to mind a verse as um, the Deuteronomy 10, 16, which says, Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. In other words, repent. Change your heart and stop being so stubborn. And where are they being stubborn? Where do they need to repent and change their heart? Stephen tells them in his summary statement, Found in Acts 7, verses 51 through 53. You stiff necked people. Your hearts and your ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. That would be Jesus. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through the angels but have not obeyed it. Like their ancestors, he's saying you resist the Holy Spirit, you persecute the prophets, you killed the ones who predicted the coming of Jesus, the righteous one, and now you predict you're persecuting his followers, 
You receive the law which, of Moses, which was indeed a privilege, but you don't obey it. And as you can imagine, this outrages the Sanhedrin, and they react. Verse 54 says, when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious, and they gnashed their teeth at him. Now, how does Stephen respond? He looks up. And in looking up, he sees God's glory and a little peek into heaven. Verses 55 and 56, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, controlled by and surrendered to the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Jesus' speech doesn't mention the resurrection of Jesus, which we talked about is so essential to the message and to our faith then and, and today. Instead, he sees the re resurrected Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now, the description um, in Scripture of Jesus in heaven is of him sitting at the right hand of God the Father. One example of many that you can find in the New Testament is found in Hebrews 8, verse 1. We do have such a high priest, he's speaking about Jesus, who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. The temple had no chairs because the priest's job was never done. They didn't sit down. Hebrews 10, 11 says, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But scripture makes a point to us repeatedly that our great high priest is sitting and that is because he is the final sacrifice for sins his work is done it is finished yet here Stephen sees Jesus standing there are two interpretations for this and I think both of them are lovely and honestly I think both of them can be true are true and I'm just going to share both of them with you the first one is this that Jesus rises stands and rises from his throne in welcome to receive the first Christian martyr his servant Stephen in heaven and another interpretation is connected to Matthew 10:32 that where Jesus says whoever acknowledges me before others I will acknowledge before my father in heaven. This interpretation suggests that Jesus stands as Stephen's advocate, as his defender and witness before the throne of the Father. What Stephen looks up and sees is a glimpse of a second greater heavenly trial that awaited him, a trial that truly mattered, and a trial where the verdict that counted had already been handed down, not guilty. And Jesus stands to acknowledge Stephen before God, as Stephen had just acknowledged Jesus before the Sanhedrin. This one's mine. I died for him. My death paid for his sins. He is clothed in my righteousness. The Sanhedrin could not stand up against the wisdom that the Spirit had given Stephen as he spoke, and they devolved from slander into violence. And they react as a quick, and violent team. Acts 5.33, that um, when Van was teaching last week, uh, read that the Sanhedrin were furious and wanted to put the apostles to death. And Van said, um, religion without Jesus makes people mean. And I'll go a step further and I'll say, religion without Jesus makes them dangerous. Stoning someone to death is not easy. It is a bloody and a violent business. And these men prepare for it by removing their coats and assigning someone to keep an eye on their belongings as they finished. Saul, who scripture will tell us approved of everything that was going on. Verses 57 through 58. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. So Luke here discreetly mentions the man who will soon be the focus of his writing in the book of Acts. Stephen's last words are found in verse 59 and 60. In verse 59, he says, it says, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Je Jesus, receive my spirit. 
Stephen's life ended the same way that it was lived, trusting in God, believing that Jesus would take care of him in the life to come. He'd already seen him standing and waiting on him. And in verse 60, it says, Then he, Stephen, fell to his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep, which is Scripture's way of saying he died. His final words may ring some familiarity with you, and they should because they are much like Jesus' final words from the cross. In Luke 23, 46, Jesus cried out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And in Luke 23, 34, he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Stephen's sermon was a death sentence. He was full of the Holy Spirit. And that was Stephen's source of wisdom and power and courage to stand before these men and proclaim the truth. Even on his knees, Stephen stood tall. Stephen had lived like Christ. He had spoken like Christ. And he would die like Christ. As his Savior did, Stephen dies with forgiveness on his lips. Now, before we shake our head at the Sanhedrin, Let's consider the boxes that we may think our God is in. God is not bound by geography, but do we think that we're going to inherit God's blessing because we live in the United States, a country that was founded on a belief in God? Do we think that because we come from a Christian family that we have somehow inherited a faith from our ancestors? God is not bound by customs or traditions in our den denominations, but do we somehow think our denomination is superior? Do we say our church prayers and liturgy without paying very much attention to what we're proclaiming? Do we participate in communion without remembering all that it's meant to point us to? God is not bound to a building, but do we go to church as a duty and check it off of our list without letting it penetrate into our hearts, hearts or our daily lives? We may not worship our church buildings, but if the, it's the only place we think we meet God is at church and we consider him absent from the rest of our lives, then we think we have him in a box. Do we think God is bound by the law or this book, the Bible? Do we carry our Bibles? Do we read it and we mark it up, but we never let it take root in our hearts? Do we follow the rules, try to look like a good person, but never let it do what Colossians 3.16 says, which is to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly? John Stott says, God's church means people, not buildings, and God's word means scripture, not traditions. So long as these essentials are preserved, the buildings and the traditions can go if necessary. We must not allow them to imprison the living God or impede his mission in the world. Today we've seen the power to stand. The power not to stand against, but to stand for. Men who stood for the widows of their community, Men who stood for others using their own giftings. Men who stood to do the work and being part of the solution in Stephen. Stephen's speech is not so much a defense against the accusations as a testimony for Jesus. Stephen, empowered by the Holy Spirit, spoke boldly, stood for Christ. And this is our last point. In a world where as Christians... We are known more for what we stand against. Point number eight, may we be known for what we stand for. The person, work, and love of Christ. May we be known for what we stand for. the person, the work, and love of Christ. May we be known for what we stand for, the person, the work, and the love of Christ. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 through 14 says, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. And then it says, do everything in love. Stephen's address is a transition speech, actually, that paves the way for presenting the gospel 
to the Gentile, which begins in the next chapter. Because this persecution causes the church to scatter. Up until now, the church has been composed mostly of Jews, has been combined, confined to Jerusalem. And Stephen's murder was the unleashing of the gospel to the Gentiles. The enemies of the gospel actually helped prevent the Christian church from becoming a Jewish sect and by scattering them, propelled them to fulfill what Jesus had asked them to do in Acts 1.8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. And next stop, chapter 8, all Judea and Samaria. Will you pray with me? God, you're so much wiser, more beautiful, more capable, more merciful, more loving than we can never understand with our finite minds. And yet your word promises that your Holy Spirit is constantly revealing more of who you are to us. May we never grow tired of learning about more of who you are, that it may penetrate our hearts and we may live differently because of it. I pray that if we have you in any, if we think we have you in any sort of box, I pray you just crack that open today and help us see you as you fully are. I just, I am blessed by the promise that, that one day we will fully know you as we are fully known. Until then, Father, may we never rest until we know more and more and more of Jesus. In our Savior's name we pray, amen. amen. For next week, will you read chapter 8 of Acts?